Uh, Elf, on to you. Right, so where I'm going now is we're diving straight into a Cyblog's blog post. So the one that I've picked up um, for this week, this is kind of my pick of the week, if you like. It's from Ariadne, our foresight blog by blogger uh, Robert Hickson. And what he's blogged about this week is stem cell therapies. For those of you that don't know, stem cells are all these wonderful little cells within our body that actually uh, end up... um, developing into all the different types of cells that actually make us up. Mm. So the idea is that, um, for instance, if you look at the very beginning of someone's life, you're only a single cell, but from that single cell can come every other kind of cell in your in your body, um, a gut cell, a blood cell, a brain cell. Well, for some of us, um, <laughs> I think some people don't have them at all, and any, any other kind of cell. Mm. And so these, these ones that are able to differentiate onto all these different cell types are called stem cells. And that's why there's been so much research into them recently is because of this ability for them to actually change and modify uh, into these individual cells. Mm. It's really, really important for things uh, like research into regenerating spinal cord, um, you know, regenerating spinal cord damage, and uh, getting the use of old neurons back. Because you have to go back to use these stem cells. You can't just implant uh, pre-differentiated cells. No, and and as we know, neurons often, well, central nervous system neurons like the spine one, often if they are damaged, don't don't heal. So you do actually have to try and make whole new ones. And so what Robert Hickson has pulled out is he's he's noted all these potential uses for stem cells. They really do have the potential to completely revolutionize the way we think about medicine and regenerative health. Yeah. But like all good stories, there is a problem. And the problem in this case is that funding is going down the toilet. So there's a lot of political issues surrounding the use of stem cells as well, which often stemmed from uh, how they were obtained and why they were obtained and whether it was ethical to obtain them or not. Um, but in this particular case, it's just a dry up of funding. And um, the reason behind this isn't actually a scientific one. And they don't even think that it's so much an ethical one. Um, uh, About a decade ago, uh, essentially the reason that this, this funding is coming under fire is that it's a very, very new, untested Um, medical therapy. And the most similar one to this is actually gene therapy. Gene therapy kind of hit the the mainstream media, I think it was about 15 years ago now, Mm. um, as this brand new way to fix all our problems. And gene therapy is when you get a virus to add genes into your own DNA, and that can fix potentially all sorts of genetic conditions. And so this was uh, this was billed as the next big thing that could fix all everything that was wrong with <laughs> with everyone. You know, it was just it was <laughs> it was the um, philosopher's stone, I guess, of of the 1990s. However, they started putting this into practice, and there were some problems. Uh, namely, they used viruses uh, which had unpredictable effects, mm. and one of these was actually to cause cancer in uh, a lot of children with a um, an immune de- sorry yeah an immune system defect. Efficiency disease, which is which is a crying shame. So the first of these trials um, ended up creating more harm than it did good. Mm. Now since then, gene therapy has come a long way, but because of those that really shaky false start, there's a lot of caution and care around the development of new technologies, and it looks like stem th- stem cell therapies are somewhat falling victim to this. So that's uh, the gist of what Robert Hickson blogs about. He does give a really, really wonderful review of um, where stem cell technologies are at the moment, where they've come through, and where they might actually find applications in the future. And he notes that uh, the actually the biggest kind of researcher in this particular field uh, at the moment is the US Armed Forces uh, Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Mm. And they're looking at it for everything from replacement limbs to all sorts of indi- individual traumas as cosmetic surgery treatments or even to just to repair burns that could not heal on their own. So it's very, very cool technology, but it's just interesting to see the interplay of that with politics and funding and ethics and everything else. Mm. It's a really interesting example of how complex science becomes when you put it in 
the real world as opposed to just thinking about it in terms of science. Agreed. And this is one of those issues as well where, where um, you know, just understanding stem cells can be relatively complex in terms of the different types of stem cells and, and even the differences between them uh, in terms of, you know, where they can be sourced from, for example. Um, and, and once you layer gene therapy on top of that, which is also fairly complicated, you can understand why if people don't understand it very well, they may shy away from it and the time necessary to understand it and, and you know, the science communication abilities necessary to understand it are also not going to be helping people really see what's going on. You still see it in, in the, the GM debate, for example, all the time. I hear all the time 25-year-old arguments against GM because people don't actually understand the science at all. Mm. Um, I, I mean, it, it is complicated science, but the thing that always – puts up a flag in my head when I hear these arguments against research into something like stem cells is that people tend to forget that we don't just have stem cells when we're tiny little kids when we're in the process of growing up and developing bones. We are producing stem cells of certain types, not of all types, mm. but certain types of stem cells throughout our lives. Yes. This is how our immune system functions. This is how our blood is able to function. This is how we uh, are able to heal ourselves. Indeed. It's through uh, stem cells amongst uh, other things and you know for, for something that works I mean I, I heal relatively well <laughs> as I have noticed over the course of my life and a large part of that is due to stem cells yeah so people forget that uh, you know they think it's a brand new technology that's never been tested rather than something that's been part of being human mm. since you know four yeah, billion don't. years ago yeah <laughs> um and, and interesting certainly uh sites and but also glad to see you know over the years the, the advances in it and the increasing amount of support in in some in some cases and in some places for it um it, it will get there eventually i have i have every confidence and the final point I'd like to make before we go on in this is that um, I'm not at all trying to insinuate that we should just go full tilt with trials, <laughs> safety be damned. Oh, God, no. That's not the way to go forward. But what will cause that is by reducing funding and forcing people to only do very limited trials on very limited populations on very limited types of stem cells. Yeah. If you jack the funding out of something, you're going to get a really skint, badly thought out, badly run version of what would happen if you gave it decent funding and actually created some decent technology. And That's just my opinion though. <laughs> agreed. I think also and or uh, dodgy um, uh, commercial and black market stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, pe people yeah, being indeed. cowboys. Yeah. Um, over at one of my favorite podcasts over at Twiv, they did a This Week in Virology, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> Check it out on iTunes. Um, they are really interesting really, really interesting uh, debate on that same particular topic a couple of episodes ago. Mm. Oh, always a good one to, to be checking out. All right. Well, well, thank you for that. Oh, that's uh, really interesting. Um, <laughs> makes me want to go and, and, and get back into that. We used to talk about it a lot when I was studying um, virology, <laughs> funnily enough. Well, you can if you don't want to get paid. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And 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 moving in a perfect segue on on from, from that and thinking back to my days in molecular biology, um, one of my Previous lecturers, in fact, my favorite virology lecturer while I was studying molecular biology, Ed Rabitsky, has gotten himself into something of a stoush. <laughs> um, Ed wrote a, how does one put it? He wrote a science fiction short story for Nature some, some weeks ago now, almost a month ago, which passed relatively unnoticed by, by the sort of scientific world for, for some weeks. Um, and has now been particularly over the last week picked up and and it's gone wild, uh, certainly amongst the science, science blogging sort of, well, fraternity is entirely the wrong word, uh, community. <laughs> In this little piece, which, which Ed says he, you know, was just trying to be funny and he never meant to hurt anybody's feelings or offend anyone. He tells the story, a uh, true story of himself and a friend who, who one night while they were doing nothing and friend's wife was in the kitchen apparently cooking food for everybody. Uh, she asked them to go and buy something for uh, their kids um, just to help, you know, with preparation for, I don't know, school school starting or something like that. These uh, middle-aged bumbling men, that's his description, went to the store a little bit late, spent too much time looking at the tech section, ran out of time to find the item they had specifically been sent there to find, came back and explained it. I, I am paraphrasing enormously here. Do read the article. Um, but explained their inability to find things uh, as the fact that they were men and women apparently can access alternate realities known as women's space, which enables them to do things like find items in shopping centers. 
uh, they also went, <laughs> it just gets worse and worse and worse. But basically, women are naturally good at running households and being domestic goddesses and men are naturally bad at that and naturally good at thinking deep thoughts about the universe and coming up with new physics theories. It caused an awful lot of unhappiness. Um, I, I, I imagine that and certainly when you read it and you read the comments, it might be clearer why perhaps some of our listeners can sort of instantly understand why this was upsetting for a lot of women in science who are very tired of, of that sort of stereotype being applied. Um, there's also unhappiness about why nature chose to publish it at all. The thing is, even if he was having a little bit of a moment, nature should have known better considering that one imagines a fair amount of their readership are female <clears throat> and tired of stereotypes. Um, both male and, and, and female. I mean, it's, it was a pretty negative stereotype of, of men as well. So one of the most interesting things about this as well is that apparently they did expect for this to cause a fair amount of controversy. Um, um, Ed Rabitsky apparently tweeted at the time that he was going to catch flack for it, which is South African for I'm going to get into trouble for this. And um, the editor in question as well, a couple of days later, posted a comment underneath said short story and uh, said, I can't believe we haven't gotten into trouble for this or words to that effect. And people are picking that up as well and saying, look, it's one thing to have a, a bit of a, a failure in, you know, paying attention here in terms of how, how offensive you, you were being. It's another thing entirely when a well-respected journal chooses to publish it. And it's being seen by a lot of people as a tacit uh, sort of we're okay with sexism from nature. But it's another thing entirely to publish it when you know it's going to offend people and alienate uh, an amount of your readership. And so people just don't understand what's going on. There's also been absolutely no response from nature. Mm. Which is uh, never a good way to be when you are the eminent science publication journal on the planet. Well, no. I mean, I've, I've seen comments by people saying, you know, I mean, they didn't read it a lot beforehand and it, they're just not going to read it anymore and they'll go to open access journals now. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I can understand that it seemed tongue in cheek and whatnot, but if, if you read it, I really don't think it particularly is. Uh, certainly, we'd be interested to hear from any of our listeners if they've read it what they think. Um, and it's not just women who are complaining at it either. So, and certainly not, you know, women who are bitter and angry and hate men. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it will be interesting to see if nature comes out with a response, and probably they should, and they probably need to. Well, fingers crossed. I guess we'll have to keep our eyes on that and see how it goes. We will be. 